I'm picking up from where I left off last night. I did a little bit about determinants, actually a lot about determinants, but not everything. So I was going to pick up there and then move on to all the eigenvalue stuff. Okay, so for those of you who weren't here last night, I'm, uh, I'm doing the complete course review. Not too many examples along the way, but that will allow me to do more Q&A. Okay, so any questions before I begin? Yes. Will both sessions next week be Q&A? The question is, will both, section, uh, well, both sessions next week be Q&A? And I feel the way things are going that the answer is not quite. I would suggest that maybe the last hour of the first session would be Q&A. But we'll see how we go. You know, my plan is just to finish what I'm doing. And when I've finished, and it depends on many questions along the way, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, whatever's left over will be Q&A. But I pre I'm pretty confident that the entire last session will be Q&A. OK, any other questions? All right. <laughs> I had divided the determinants information or study plan into three areas. One is how to compute. That was A. B was properties of the determinant. And now C is significance of the determinant. So I'm going to pick up right there significance of the determinant of the debt. And there's not a lot, but there were two sort of basic concepts. So the first is entirely basic, that debt A is not equal to zero if and only if A is invertible. OK, so I've mentioned it, but it's really important. That's actually why it's called the determinant, because it determines whether the matrix is invertible or not. This is for a square matrix, of course. Rectangular matrices, which are not square, do not have determinants, nor can they be invertible. OK, so that's one significance of the determinant. But there's a more important significance in a way um, that the actual value of the determinant gives you something about volumes. So here goes. We have a collection of vectors v1, v2, vm, and they are n-dimensional vectors. And for the sake of argument, I'm going to assume that m is less than or equal to n. As in, we don't have more vectors than the number of dimensions of the underlying space. We could have less, could have fewer. All right. What I want you to do is think of these geometrically. Here's 0, v1, v2. Okay, if there's only two of them, you can understand a parallelogram. If you're in three dimensions, and this is a sort of third dimension, you can understand a parallelopiped, which is a solid whose faces are all parallel. And these vectors kind of supply the bottom edges emanating from one point. But once you know those, you can fill in the rest just by drawing in all the parallel segments. In four dimensions, it's sort of harder to see. In fact, it's more or less impossible to visualize. But I mean, there would be a fourth vector uh, pulling out. And actually, if you think about this, the faces, the two-dimensional faces of this parallelopiped in three dimensions are all parallelograms. So whatever this four-dimensional thing looks like, if you had four vectors, say, in four dimensions, you would see that the three-dimensional faces of this weird four-dimensional object are themselves parallelopipeds. So you have to somehow build something with faces as these three-dimensional objects. So it's, it gets a little bit hairy. But anyway, we can write down the equations of it. Um, the point being that even if you're in three dimensions and you had only two vectors, you still can get a parallelogram. That's fine. So you don't need as many vectors. Uh, OK, so anyway, these generate a appropriate m-dimensional parallelopiped Parallelly piped. Eh. 
and the determinant essentially gives you its volume. Well, you have to be a little careful about it. Let A be equal to the matrix whose columns are V1 through Vm. Then, if M equals N, as in there are N vectors and the vector, the matrix A is square, the volume of the parallelopiped, of that parallelopiped, is just the absolute value of the determinant of A. That's a really lovely fact. So here I note that A is square. Okay. So the volume just is the value of the determinant. So we now know what the determinant means. The only thing that's ambiguous is the sign of it. Is it positive or negative? And actually what that gives you is some idea of the ordering. If, for example, you have three vectors, then there's this right-hand rule. And so the determinant will be positive if the vectors are in that order. If you swap two of the columns, as we know, the determinant changes sign. OK, we, change, we talked about it for rows, but the same thing applies for columns. And that actually reverses the right-handedness to left-handedness of it. And so the determinant becomes negative means that you switched handedness of the thing. And we don't get into that. We really don't get into that. But the point is that the actual value of the absolute value of the determinant is uh, related to the volume. Now, one other comment here. What if these vectors are not linearly independent and there are n of them? They're not linearly independent. What's, what can you say about the resulting square matrix? Is it invertible? No. Invertible matrices are square and the columns form a basis of Rn, and in particular are linearly independent. And so if they're not, then A is not invertible, so its determinant is zero. Why then is the volume of the parallelopiped zero? Well, this is an n-dimensional volume, and yet one of the vectors actually lies, at least one lies in the span of the others. So in the case of three dimensions, you'd have three vectors that all lie in a plane, and so the actual parallelopiped that they generate is flat. It's, it's a two-dimensional object. Now, it has an area, but it doesn't have a volume. And the point is that the volume is then zero. So I think when you look at a formula, it's important to understand that that actually completely implies this. That, that second fact, part A thereof, uh, implies the first, if you think about it in the right way. And I haven't seen any specific true-false questions that involve that, but you never know. OK. If m is less than n, so this would be the case if you were specifically given two vectors, say, in R3, and you want to know the area of the parallelogram, the two-dimensional area of the parallelogram. Um, you can't use this formula because a is not square. So instead, the volume is now equal to the square root of the determinant of a transpose a. That's the correct formula to use if you have fewer. OK, so just to put this in context, we've looked at A transpose A a bunch of times. And we decided that if A has a kernel just 0, then this is invertible. And in that case, the, that's the same as saying the columns of A are linearly independent. So if the columns of A are linearly independent, this is a square matrix which is invertible. On the other hand, if they are linearly dependent, as in one of them is in the subspace spanned by the rest of them, then again, the volume should be 0. This will be a square matrix that's not invertible, and the determinant will be 0. So it all is consistent. The other thing I would comment is you could use this formula if m equals n, and you get the same as this. Because the determinant of A transpose A, you can expand as the determinant of A transpose times the determinant of A. But we already said that the determinant of A transpose is the same as the determinant of A. So this is just the square root of the determinant of A all squared. And the square root of something squared is the absolute value. 
So you don't need to prove that. Or it's worth realizing that that implies this. On the other hand, I would never use this formula if given that m equals n. Because why bother computing a transpose a? It, it's just so much more work than just taking the determinant. So there's a reason for the separate formula. OK. Is the determinant of a transpose a always positive? That's a good question. And it turns out that the answer is yes, it is. But uh, to prove that, you, you need to do a little bit of work. Uh, you had a question as well. Was it the same? Uh, yes, I can explain <laughs> m volume in some sense. I mean, basically, since these are parallelograms uh, and parallelopipeds, I can define a volume as follows. So these solids assume, suppose you know what the m minus 1 dimensional volume is, and you want to do inductively a definition of the m. OK, so you know what two-dimensional area is, and you want to know what is three-dimensional volume of a parallelopiped. Well, the base is some parallelogram, and you know how to find the area of that. And then you have this other vector. So what you do is you project onto this, and you find the v perp. And then you say, oh, the, the three volume is equal to the base area times the perpendicular. OK, so that gives you the three volume. Now, how would you get the four volume? Well, you take one of the faces of this four-dimensional object, and you would say, OK, that's a regular old parallelopiped in three dimensions. I know how to find it's more. OK, now look at this fourth vector. OK, I can't visualize it, but I mean, here's the base. Here's this vector. Find the projection onto that three dimensional subspace and take the perpendicular. And the four volume is literally defined as the base volume, which is three volume, times the perpendicular height. OK, so it gets a little bit theoretical, but there is a geometric significance as well. OK, so basically, you'll be given a number of vectors, and you'll be told what the volume is, and then you have to use the formula. But it's good to know what you're doing if you can. OK, so any other questions about this? Yes, there's a good question. How do you know this is always going to be positive? OK, so the question is, for the sake of the video, the question is, if you want to know why this is positive, couldn't you just expand it out and say, oh, this is the same as the determinant of a squared, which is what I just said. So why could you? Why, I, I, I say no. Why? Does anyone know? Well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're not square necessarily. In fact, if m is less than n, there is it's, it's not square. So you can't just expand it. All right. So you have to be a little bit careful. But on the other hand, if you really want to see a proof, I mean, I guess this could be a true, false, or a proof question. Suppose uh, a is at least. Positive. That's this is a subside sort of thing. But since it's asked, and I consider it to be rel uh, relevant, why would that be true? Well, it's pretty tricky. It's pretty tricky. I don't necessarily say that it's obvious, and I'm not sure I know exactly how to do it off the top of my head. But here's what I would say. First of all, a transpose a is symmetric. Okay, we did talk about that last night. So first of all, a transpose a is symmetric. Okay, we haven't done the spectral theorem yet. But one of the points of the symmetric of the uh, of the spectral theorem is that it can be diagonalized, and what's more, all the eigenvalues are real. So a transpose a, all eigenvalues are real, and there is n of them, and there are and there are n, and that's the spectral theorem. There are n counting multiplicities. OK, so let's see. Where does that lead us? This means that you have a transpose a v, like we'll lambda v. And what you'd like to show is that essentially lambda cannot be negative. That's what I'd like to show. So 
I want to show lambda is positive. Or at least zero is possible. So how would we go about doing that? Well, let's suppose we take A transpose A V and we take the dot product of that with V. Okay, so how do we use this fact? Well, one way of looking at it is that this is equal to lambda v dot v. Because a transpose a v is lambda v. Of course, v dot v is just the norm of lambda uh, of v squared. Okay, on the other hand, I, I mentioned last time that a v dot w is equal to v dot a transpose w. So actually, if you throw the a onto the other piece, you get a transpose. Here, if you throw the a transpose onto the other piece, this is also equal to a v dot a transpose transpose v. And that's a bit of a, a step, but it happens to be true. And so this is equal to a v squared. All right, so that means this is greater than or equal to 0. This is greater than or equal to 0. So lambda equals a v squared over v squared, which is greater than or equal to 0. Yeah, OK, so I could prove it. I think that's a little bit much to expect one, you know, someone in this course to do on the exam. This is not Math 204. That's a Math 204 problem. That's my opinion. I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm just saying it's unfair to put that on a Math 202 exam. But notice the technique, by the way, just in case. If you want to show something is positive, it's often a very good idea to do it by uh, dot product. If you're lucky, you get... Um, you get these norms coming out. By the way, here's, here's a question. Suppose I showed you this proof and said, how do I know that I can divide by the absolute value of, uh, sorry, the norm of v squared? Any reason for that? What, what could go wrong with that? It could be zero. So when is this quantity zero? Only when v is zero. And why isn't v zero? Because eigenvectors are not zero, by definition. All right, so every eigenvalue of this is positive, or at least non-negative. So what does that tell us about the determinant of that matrix? It's the product of the eigenvalues. So the determinant of A transpose A is equal to the product of eigenvalues which is greater than or equal to zero because every eigenvalue is. All right, so again, you know, I wouldn't get too caught up about that, but it, it is a good question. Why is this, why is this well-defined? Asked and answered. All right, so, you have two formulas that I'm just erasing right now that you're expected to be able to quote and use. And again, we may look at a question about that, but uh, I'm not going to give a specific example. On the other hand, there's something else to think about. And that is in terms of volume expansion, which I'd like to talk about now. All right, suppose that Q is a subset of Rn, which is a parallelopiped. So Q is one of these parallelopipeds. And let's assume that it's n-dimensional. So it has a non-zero volume. So if we're in three dimensions, we have three vectors that are linearly independent that give us a parallelopiped. So I'm thinking of it as being attached to the origin like this, similar to the picture I erased. Sorry, it's not very parallel. It's hard to, hard to do it with the blackboard glare. OK, so here is an object. Now, you have a linear transformation. 
And of course, that changes one vector into another vector. Now, what if we apply it to every vector in here? So it's all of the vectors in the interior, on the faces, the interior, all the way there. I want to take every vector one by one and apply the linear transformation and then see what I get. So they're not just the vectors even to the end, they're the vectors in the middle as well. But not this one. No, that's not inside. Not even this one and not even further. I want just the vectors that lie inside the parallel of pipe and I want to hit every single one of them with the transformation T or the matrix A, if you like. Well, I'll get some other shape. What is that other shape? Well, it turns out that is also a parallel of pipe Okay, so if I apply A, and here's zero, I'm drawing two separate pictures, I get another parallel epiphid. It could be looking quite different. And the way to see it is you just see what happens to V1, V2, and V3. And they become AV1, AV2, and AV3. And then linear combinations of them get preserved. And so linear combinations that flesh out this parallelopiped become linear combinations that flesh out this parallelopiped. Okay, so the image or the transformation of Q by A gives another parallelopiped. And specifically, I'm considering, i.e., the set of Q, I'm sorry, of AX for all X in Q. That's exactly the mathematical notation of what I'm saying. Take every vector that lies inside Q, this, this set. This is not a matrix, this is a set. So, bless you. Take every X that lies in this set and hit it with A, and you will get a new set that is also a parallel epiphone. Okay, so then the question is, how do you compare the volumes? So the new parallel of Piper's volume, new parallel of Piper, you can fill that in in your notes if you like, I'm not going to write it, is equal to the volume of the old. Oops. The volume of the old parallel of Piper times the absolute value of the determinant of A. Because I'm assuming A is A squared. I'm assuming A is N by N. Then this is, well, this makes sense. You can take its determinant. Okay, so in that sense, the volume is expanded by a factor expanded by a factor of the determinant of A, absolute value thereof. Okay, so the only difference between the content of this thought and the content of the previous one, where we just looked at a volume, is that here you actually don't even need to know a volume. Before, in the previous case, you, you know a volume. You're asked, okay, here are some vectors, they flesh out a parallel epiped, what's its volume? Here, you actually are not even knowing, you don't know what a single volume is, you just know what the ratio of two volumes is. The new to the old is the determinant of A, absolute value. So it's a subtle difference. Again, this fact incorporates the old fact, because if you think about it this way, consider the basis vectors, E1, E2, E3. That's just a cube, which is a special form of parallel piped. So the, the Q that's involved here is a cube. And the volume is 1. Volume is 1. And then if you do AE1, you get this. AE1, AE2, AE3. And so that cube will transform 
into that parallel pipette. And so by what I'm saying, the volume expansion factor is the determinant of A. So since we started with a volume of 1, the new volume you get is the determinant of A absolute value times 1, which is, of course, just the absolute value of the determinant of A. OK, so what? Well, this is the column of A. This is the first column of A. This is the second column, and this is the third column. So, of course, the volume of this is the volume of the parallel pipe spanned by the columns of A. So this already includes the previous, at least part A of it, with the n vectors. It's a little more complicated when you have fewer than n. So this, this includes that concept. But it's just subtly different. And I have seen problems, and again, I'm sure some of them will be asked, uh, in previous finals involving expansions rather than explicit volumes. And you know the typical thing is where you have a dynamical system and you're asked, oh, well, what happens? You start with the elements in a parallel pipe bed and then you wait t seconds or something and what's the new volume? And again, it's just the old volume times the determinant of whatever matrix is out front. OK, so again, we'll, we'll be, I'm sure, looking at some examples. But that's pretty much what I wanted to say about determinants. So before I move on to the last super topic of eigenvalues and their consequences, of course, I've been using eigenvalues along the way. But you know, before I move on to that, I want to see if there's any questions about determinants. Yeah? What, what happens if you have something where the video transformation A or the transformation matrix A is a different thing by A? So the question is, you have a transformation matrix A that isn't n by n. And then the question, what is the volume expansion? And so things get a little bit tricky because you, know, you might have started with an n volume and get mapped onto an m volume. And there are ways you can salvage this by talking about A transpose A determinant square root as we did before. But that's not in the syllabus. So what happens is you have to start worrying about collapsing, is it an m dimensional volume you're taking at the end, and you know, if you're going from n to m. And there are all sorts of questions that arise, and you have to take some cases and all that sort of stuff. And so I will sweep it under the rug and say it's not in the course. Okay? Not a fair game question to have different dimensions, as in a not being square. But it is fair game just to say, here are three vectors in R4. Uh, they span, a, you know, they generate a parallel pipe with three dimensions. What's the 3D volume? Because there is the formula. But in terms of expansions, no. We're not going to touch it. Any other questions about the determinant? Yeah. So if we're looking for area, let's say we have two three dimensional vectors and we wonder area. So you have, you have two vectors in R3 and they have a parallel, they span a parallelogram. What is the area? Yes, that's given by the previous formula, and that's allowed. But in terms of expansions of non-three-dimensional objects in R3, we haven't really covered it. OK? Any other questions? All right. I will retire this piece of paper, which has served me well, and switch to this one. I don't. I don't write very big, I'm afraid, when I write these notes out. So, OK, I had divided the syllabus post midterm up into three sections. And this is the third one. And it's a big one. It's a really big one. I've got here eigenvalues. Eigenvalues. And vectors. And I will simply be writing eval and evec. This is not a recognized abbreviation. I am writing it for the sake of my arm tonight. But I strongly recommend that you don't use it. You should write out eigenvalue and eigenvector because you are being graded. I am not being graded. So I reserve this right. But yes. You should get away with it, but why take the risk on a final? OK. I have three things, three areas here 
that I wanted to sort of bring up. The first is the basics. The second is symmetric matrices and quadratic forms. And the third is dynamical systems. So actually, when we did it in class, we did dynamical systems of discrete form much earlier. And then we did the continuous case. And they have so much in common that now I kind of want to just leave it all to the end. And I probably won't finish it today. So dynamical systems, if that's all you want to hear, you should come back uh, next week. But in the meantime, I, I'm going to spend some time on the basics. So here is a, no, I like to use geometrical shapes. A gets a circle. All right. First of all, the definition and properties. Okay, so what you want, lambda is an eigenvalue for A. And it's absolutely crucial that you understand that this means AV equals lambda V for some V. not equal to 0. OK, so to say that lambda is an eigenvalue means that there is an eigenvector. Uh, let there be no mystery about it. Real, complex, whatever. I mean, if lambda is an eigenvalue, there is at least one eigenvector. And in fact, as we know, the span of that eigenvector, namely the one-dimensional line or subspace through it, is also everything along there is an eigenvector. So the eigenspace is non-trivial. All right, so that's exactly what it means to be an eigenvalue. And notice that v has to be non-zero, as I said. Zero is not an eigenvector. It's, it's just a zero. Zero satisfies this equation for any lambda. So that's kind of pointless. All right. right. Lambda is allowed to be complex. But then normally you would call it a complex eigenvalue. If lambda is complex, then the coordinates inside v could also be complex numbers. So, but a is still going to be real. It doesn't have to be in advanced linear algebra, but in our course, a is real. So all the elements here are real. v might be complex numbers. When you multiply it out, you get complex numbers, and maybe for some other complex number, if you multiply that into all the components, they actually match. And so if that equation is satisfied, even if lambda is complex and the elements inside the v are complex, then you would consider lambda to be a complex eigenvalue and v to be a complex eigenvector. And we are going to allow that, as I said. OK, an important note. If v is an eigenvector, for lambda equals 0, then by definition, AV is 0. It's 0 times V, so it's just 0, i.e., V would be in the kernel of A. So eigenvector 0 is, or well, eigenvector for eigenvalue 0 is the same as the kernel. Right. What else do I have to tell you? So as we saw yesterday, actually, projections, all the eigenvalues are 0 or 1. I'll say 1 or 0. Reflections, the eigenvalues are 1 or minus 1. And now that I think about it, I must have missed something fairly egregious about orthogonal projection. Did I just not write it down? Maybe I just it just slipped out of my notes. Or am I going to do it later? I don't know if I'm going to do it later. Let me do it now. Or maybe I considered it to be maybe I considered it to be pre-midterm, but let me just say something about the reflection. We talked a lot about orthogonal projection 
just to remind you, if P is the orthogonal projection onto V, then R is 2P minus the identity. That's a really useful formula, is the reflection in V. That, that actually we did do pre-midterm. So 2P minus the identity will give you the reflection. Okay, so the top one we actually looked at yesterday, we diagonalized the projection and we saw that it was in fact, the diagonal had to be one or zero because the square of each eigenvalue is the same as the eigenvalue itself. But, uh, well, <laughs> this is true for any basis because uh, eigenvalues are the same under similarity transformations, but we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. But basically the way to view it is you have this V and you have a V perp. And V is preserved. And now, by the way, eigenvalue 1 means AV equals V, as in A doesn't change V. And so any vector in this subspace V is preserved by the projection and the reflection. So for both of them, they have eigenvalues of 1. So the eigenspace for these in both cases is V. Now in the case of something in V perp, if you're doing the projection, that goes down to zero. So the eigenvalue is zero. If you're doing the reflection, it becomes minus V. And so the, the uh, eigenvalue is negative one. So once you know this, you have this. And we, we did do this last time, so. All right, so another question. I'm sorry, is a linear what? Okay, so what if x is neither in v nor in v perp? And you will find that that cannot be an eigenvector of either the reflection or the projection. So the projection will just be the x parallel part, which is not a multiple of x unless it's either 0 or it's x itself. And the same thing under reflection. So think about how this reflects down here. This is not a multiple of this. So it's not an eigenvector. The only way it will is if it's actually on the mirror or perpendicular to it. Okay? Any other questions about that aspect? I just had said last time I told you how to get the projection onto the V perp once you know V, but I didn't tell you how to get the reflection. So you know multiple ways of getting the projection. To get the reflection, find the projection, multiply the matrix by two, and subtract one from the diagonals. So learn that formula in other words. It's much more reliable than just trying to remember, you know, to work it out on the fly. Okay. Now, along these lines, actually, notice that this is a fairly simple modification to P. And actually, there's a general sort of principle that's related here. Suppose AV equals lambda V. Then... A plus any multiple of the identity. If you multiply that by V, you get AV plus just KV. Because the identity times V is just V, and you have this scalar K. In other words, well, A V is lambda V. So you get just lambda plus K times V. So starting with an eigenvector V of A, you get an eigenvector V of this new matrix A plus K I. So the conclusion in words is if lambda and V are an eigenvalue eigenvector pair for A, then lambda plus K 
and V are a corresponding pair for the matrix A plus K times the identity. So the eigenvector is the same, it's V. These two matrices, A and A plus KI, have the same eigenvectors as each other. However, the eigenvalues differ by K. to every element of the diagonal of A. So if you just take the diagonal elements of A and bump them up by seven, you don't change the eigenspaces. You have to bump them all up by seven, or 10, or whatever. You don't change the eigenspaces. Subtract minus pi. That's the same, any, any multiple. You just change the eigenvalues, okay? All right, that's the basics. Any questions? None. All right, let's talk about characteristic polynomials. Two. Characteristic polynomials and also finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors. All right, the first thing is to define the characteristic polynomial, which is written as f of a and lambda, and this is the determinant of a minus lambda i. And already, this actually connects to the last fact that I wrote. Here, of course, I looked at a plus k i, and this is, of course, the same thing with lambda being minus k. So, what does this tell you? This is a polynomial in lambda of degree n. When you actually write it out, expand it, work it out, that's what you get. Okay, so to find the eigenvalues, real and complex, Solve the equation that a minus lambda i is zero. So you want to find the roots of this polynomial for lambda. Okay, so a little comment is that a polynomial of degree n has always got n complex roots if you count multiplicities. However, it may or may not have any real roots at all. So you may not find any real solutions. For example, lambda squared plus one equals zero. There's no lambda, no, no real lambda that works there. Okay, so just be aware of that. Anyway, yeah. There are always n total roots, including multiplicities of a polynomial of degree n over complex numbers, but not over real. Over real, there's at most n, but there might be zero. You mean algebraic, right? Not geometric. It's all algebraic at the moment, yes. I'm just talking about a polynomial here, and that will relate to algebraic, but I'm saving that definition for a few seconds here. All right, so this tells you how to find the eigenvalues. And if you only care about real, then you only find the real solutions. If you care about complex, you find all the solutions, real and complex. To find the eigenvectors, you actually really want to find the eigenspaces. But let's just say eigenvectors for the moment. What you do is you find the kernel of a minus lambda i of n for each eigenvalue. Okay, and we've done pre-midterm how to find the kernel. It's basically Gauss-Jordan elimination. So, 
you have to do this first. You cannot find the eigenvectors without the eigenvalues. Otherwise, you will be trying a hell of a lot of different lambdas here and finding that most of the kernels are zero. And for the very special lambdas that you should have done finding, that you should have found first, you will get a kernel that's not just the zero vector. OK, so this is a trick you know that first you write down det a minus lambda i, and then later you write cur a minus lambda i for each of the individual lambdas. And of course, as you know from you know what we've done since all over the symmetric matrices stuff and, and the dynamical systems, you need to find these ones. Sorry. I yeah, I guess the book talks a little bit about yeah, Kyle numbers, yeah, but you you don't need to know it. You, we know how to find kernels. To, to find a kernel, you solve a x equals zero, and we know how to solve a x equals b. So don't don't worry about these fancy techniques. Just 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 follow the program. Okay, any other questions at the moment? All right, so the thing is that actually kernel, actually kernel of A minus lambda I is a subspace of Rn, which is called the eigenspace. Maybe I'll call it E space, but you shouldn't for lambda. So when I say find the eigenvectors, OK, fine. If the kernel's one dimensional, you could just say, oh, there's eigenvector. But if the kernel's two dimensional, say, then everything in that plane is an eigenvector for the same eigenvalue. So it's best to think of the eigenspace and it, instead. And it's written E lambda. And the kernel then that you get will be a span of something. You have to find a basis for it. So when it says, when I say find and find all the eigenvectors, it's better to say find the eigenspaces and give the solution as the span of vectors rather than vectors themselves. All right. For diagonal triangular matrices, say so let's say for triangular, upper or lower. or diagonal, matrices, the eigenvalues are the diagonal elements. It's a useful fact. Remember, the determinant was just the product of the diagonal elements. So if you replace the diagonal elements by whatever they are minus lambda, then you'll just get a whole bunch of factors that look like a1 minus lambda, a2 minus lambda, and so on, where a1, a2 are the diagonal elements. So that just follows from that previous observation. OK. If n is odd, as in an odd number, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, etc., there is always a real value at least one real eigenvalue. If n is odd, so three by three matrices must have one real eigenvalue. And that is because the characteristic polynomial over here would have an odd degree. And polynomials of odd degrees have at least one real root. right? If you graph them, one side goes up and the other one goes down. So by the intermediate value theorem, they cross somewhere. There's a bit of calculus that I just threw in. So essentially, if it's odd, you know there's at least one real eigenvalue. If it's even, there need not be. And I've seen this sort of fact come up in various forms on true-false questions. So it's worth noting. And the last thing I want to say about characteristic polynomials 
is that there is a particular form for them if you actually expand them. And I haven't seen many questions on this directly, but it might be worth noting that the, the term of a minus lambda i, when you actually expand it out, should look like this. The first term should be either lambda to the n or minus lambda to the n. So, I mean, the, the minus will only be there if n is odd. And then the very first term will be trace of a times minus lambda to the n minus 1. And it's harder to interpret all the other terms except for the constant term, which is the determinant of a itself. So there's some significance to the constant term. It is just the determinant of a. And that's not surprising. Put lambda equals 0, and you get det a equals blah, 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 everything cancels out except det a. Okay, That's not surprising. Slightly more tricky is to understand why the first term, the coefficient, is essentially minus the trace of a. It doesn't look like minus there, but it really is minus, because if this is a plus, this is a minus. If the power is in minus 1, whereas if this is a minus, this is a plus. So relative to this one, it's sort of minus trace a, but whatever. Basically, that coefficient should pop up. So it can be a reality check, actually, if you write down that, or it can be a time saver. In particular, if it's just a two by two matrix, you can just sort of write it down. I don't know. I, I tend to put in the minus lambda and just compute the damn determinant anyway. It's all up to you. But the point about this is that this actually means that the trace of A is equal to the sum of the eigenvalues. The sum of the complex eigenvalues including multiplicity, algebraic multiplicity if you like, And the determinant of A is the product of the complex eigenvalues, including the multiplicities. So if you know the eigenvalues, you can get the trace and the determinant without even looking at the matrix. The only caveat that I would say is that if there is only, say, one real eigenvalue and two complex eigenvalues for a 3 by 3 matrix, then you have to include the complex eigenvalues there. If all the eigenvalues are real, then this is just the sum of the eigenvalues and the product of the eigenvalues. But if they're complex, you have to include those for these formulas to be correct. And I just want to remind you, we spent a lot of time talking about the determinant, but reminder that trace A is the sum of the diagonals. some of the diagonal elements of A. And it's also the sum of the eigenvalues. I'm not saying that the eigenvalues are themselves the diagonal elements of A. They, they just happen to have the same sum. A no question. All n eigenvalues are uh, where you, you know, every polynomial of degree n has n solutions which which are complex numbers, counting multiplicities, right? It Real numbers are complex too, but not vice versa necessarily. So the point is that there are guaranteed to be, including multiplicities, again, algebraic multiplicities, n complex eigenvalues. And their sum is the same as the sum of the diagonals of A, and their product is the same as the determinant of A. If you're lucky, there happen to be n real, and then everything is fine. You don't even have to worry about complex. But if there are not n real, then you have to include the complex ones in those two formulas, or else it doesn't make sense. Every vector with, um, with a complex eigenvalue is a complex vector? So the question is, if you have a complex eigenvalue, does the corresponding eigenvector, or does a corresponding eigenvector have to be complex? And that's probably, I think that's true if the matrix is real. In general, the elements of a matrix could be complex as well, and then you might get lucky. 
but say anything about what really happens to the complex eigenvectors? Uh, the question is, can you say anything about what happens to complex eigenvector? Well, I mean, it has a real and imaginary part, right? Yeah. So you have this. The question is, we want to understand complex eigenvalues, and this is as good a place as any to understand it. Suppose that A V is lambda V, except that instead of lambda, I want to, let, I want to deal with a, an imaginary eigenvalue. So let's do this. A V plus I W equals P plus I Q V plus I W. So the way I'm trying to understand this is this is A times a vector which is complex, as in every entry of the vector is complex. So I can bust up the two vectors into a real vector plus i times another real vector. And this I'm writing as v plus iw. And this is supposed to be lambda, that's lambda here, times itself. Whereas lambda, I'm going to assume is complex as well, so I will write it as p plus iq. So if you actually expand this out, you will find that AV plus IAW is equal to. Well, you'll have PV minus QW as the real part. P, the vector V, minus QW plus I times QV plus PW. So in a real sense, if you equate real parts and imaginary parts, you find that AV has to equal PV minus QW. And you find that AW has to equal QV plus PW. So neither V nor W are themselves eigenvectors of A. They're not. AV is PV minus QW. And AW is QV plus PW. So the QV spoils the fun there, and the QW spoils the fun. And in both cases, it's the Q that spoils the fun. And that's not surprising, since Q is the imaginary part. OK, so what this shows you, though, is that there, there is a sort of twisted connection between V and W. They combine and they work together in a, in a mysterious fashion. So if this is true for some, if you find AV as PV minus QW, it's not very clear that AW will also happen to equal QV plus PW. So there's a sort of rotation going on here if you look at the actual matrix. And I will talk about diagonalizing matrices which don't have real eigenvalues later. But I mean, this is your question is, what is the sort of real interpretation of a complex eigenvalue, a complex eigenvector? Well, if there is one, it's that a complex eigenvector is a combination of a real and an imaginary one. Well, this is the real, this is the imaginary part. And they are connected by that pair of equations. But they don't really mean as much as saying A V equals lambda V. And so it's best not to think about that too much. It doesn't, it, it's not as satisfying. Although in two dimensions, it leads to a nice formula, which we'll do in a second. All right, so that's pretty much all I want to say about characteristic polynomials. Any other questions at this point? Yes? Some better understand like the question. Suppose we're going to get cubic, you know, third degree equation along the factoring. Yeah, factoring cubics. Uh, I mean, I don't Yeah, OK, so the question is, you know, sometimes you're dealing with three by three matrices. And so you'll get a cubic equation here. And if you want to find the eigenvalues, you have to factor the cubic. And so sometimes the cubic looks like it has a factor of lambda already. If you're lucky, there's no constant term, in which case lambda is 0, and you're fine. Sometimes along the way, remember, when you expand a determinant, you have three terms because you're expanding, say, along the top. You might only have two or one, but it, maybe you have three terms. Okay, And sometimes, if you're lucky, before you add them all together and expand them, you can see a common factor in each of the terms, in which case pull it out of each term, and then you'll just have a quadratic left. 
And otherwise, you're just going to have to search for a root in, in there. And so what I try to do is look for factors of the constant term. That's normally the way. Just try them one by one. And uh, if you don't find it easily, possibly you look at the determinant. Is Follow up. Then, you know, for, uh, Is it worth learning the general characteristic polynomial for n equals 3, where there's only one of them? Well, you don't get something extremely nice. You get something across between the trace and the determinant. But I, no, I think for, for any 3 by 3, I, I would just write down the matrix and compute the determinant. Just, just do it. I mean, it doesn't take very long. I don't know what the general form is myself, so that would be how I would do it. I've never found a problem on a previous final that I couldn't do fairly quickly using that technique, and also that I couldn't factor using one of the techniques that I spoke of. But as you say, a Q&A session will reveal. Any other questions? All right. Let's move on. Enough basics. Let's get a little, hands a little dirtier, as it were, and talk about multiplicity and diagonalization. Three, mult, and diag on allization. OK, so we've been talking about multiplicities. When I say the al algebraic multiplicity of lambda, it's the degree of, let's say, of lambda 0, is the degree of lambda minus lambda 0 in the determinant. In other words, what's the highest power of lambda minus lambda naught in there? And we sort of intuitively understand that, for example, if you factored this in the case of a 3 by 3 as, say, lambda minus 2 squared times lambda plus 5, then the solutions are lambda equals 2, 2, and minus 5. You see, technically, it's only 2 and minus 5. But you see, I look at the square here, and I say, oh, there's really a double root of 2. So in other words, lambda equals 2 had multiplicity 2. Lambda equals minus 5. It has algebraic multiplicity 2, rather. And this ha uh, lambda equals minus 5 has algebraic multiplicity 1, because it only appears once as a factor. OK, so this is just the algebra. It has nothing to do with linear algebra, uh, at least no, nothing to do with linear transformations. It's just a polynomial. It's, it's an algebraic fact. On the other hand, the geometric multiplicity, which I will define in a few seconds, has a lot to do with the geometry, funnily enough, given its name. And here is the definition of it. The geometric multiplicity of lambda zero, zero is a dimension of the kernel of a minus lambda i, or lambda 0 i. Well, lambda naught is a specific eigenvalue like 2 or minus 5. You might be wondering why I didn't use lambda. Unfortunately, I've already used lambda as a dummy variable. So I, I, I can't say lambda minus lambda here. So it's a specific one. So the, the geometric multiplicity is the dimension of the kernel. Okay, Remember, the kernel is what you looked at to find the eigenvalues. And so this is its dimension. This is also known as the nullity, of course, of a minus lambda i. But let's not get too worked up over fancy words. That's what it is. That's the geometric multiplicity. Now, here are some facts. The geometric multiplicity is less than or equal to the algebraic multiplicity of the same 
eigenvalue. Okay, that's an important fact. On the other hand, this is at least one, unless that's not even an eigenvalue. If this is not an eigenvalue, of course, both of these quantities are zero. So to be more concrete, when I look at a matrix A whose characteristic polynomial has a double root at two, say, and a, a single root at minus five, and I think about what the eigenvectors are, I know there's a one-dimensional subspace of, eigenvalue, of eigenvectors. So the eigenspace here, so in this example, the geometric multiplicity of minus 5 is 1. There is exactly one eigenvector along with its multiples for minus 5. Question. Yeah, I guess I'm happy to put this where the caveat is this is only true if lambda 0 is actually an eigenvalue. If it isn't, then this kernel is nothing. It's just the vector 0 and it has dimension 0. So if you make the mistake of talking about the geometric multiplicity of a non-eigenvalue, it's 0. <laughs> Or the algebraic multiplicity of a non-eigenvalue is also zero because it won't be a factor here. So, I mean, that's a technicality. And, and you really shouldn't be talking about multiplicities of either. But So as long as you're dealing with an eigenvalue, yes, the geometric multiplicity is at least one and at most the algebraic multiplicity. And in this case, the algebraic multiplicity of the spine is one, so the geometric multiplicity must also be one. On the other hand, the geometric multiplicity of lambda equals 2 is either 1 or 2. You cannot tell just from this polynomial here without knowing what A is and actually investigating the eigenspace by computing the kernel. You can just not tell. There's not enough. But it must be 1 or 2. Okay. If it's only 1, then you only have two dimensions worth of eigenspace. You're missing a dimension. And then this matrix would not be diagonalizable. And that is my next topic of discussion. OK, so any questions about what's up here? Any other questions? OK, so I, I didn't write it down. But I think it's worth saying that if you actually want to find out what this is, you must compute this quantity. But hopefully you've already done it, because I've already, you know, you've already found the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. So you've found the eigenspaces, and you look at their dimensions, and you see what is going on. Now, let's look at this specific case. If it turns out that the sum of the geometric multiplicities equals n. This is very good. You should do a mental, yay. OK, because it means that the matrix is much nicer than it might have been. OK. So let's just see what this means. So the first consequence is, here are some consequences. First of all, this must mean we know that the sum of the algebraic multiplicities is n. Since the sum of the algebraic multiplicities is automatically n, always, because after all, there are n roots. And this is true for, well, OK, let me qualify this a little bit.
This is including the complex eigenvalues. This is if you include complex eigenvalues. then this must mean that every geometric multiplicity equals the corresponding algebraic multiplicity. Geometric mult of each eigenspace equals the algebraic mult of corresponding eigenvalue. So in the previous case, there were three eigenvalues, 2, 2, and minus 5. And they're all real. And we said we know that the geometric multiplicity of minus 5 is 1. The geometric multiplicity of 2 is either 1 or 2. If it is 2, 1 plus 2 equals 3, and we're in business. 3 is the magic number in this case. But if it's only 1, 1 plus 1 is not equal to 3, and then we're not in business. So it's you include real eigenvalues or complex eigenvalues, but I might just say if you only want real eigenvalues, and you still have this, the sum of the geometric multiplicities is n. Then all the eigenvalues must be real as well. So I don't know. I mean, if you have some complex eigenvalues and you only care about the real ones, then the algebraic multiplicity of just the real ones doesn't add up to n. OK, so if you have, for example, a 3 by 3 matrix with one real and two complex eigenvalues, then, and you only care about the real ones, well, the algebraic multiplicity of the real one would be 1. And of course, the geometric multiplicity would be 1. Then <laughs> it couldn't possibly, you can't get the geometric multiplicities adding up to 3, because you only have 1. Yes, the complex ones would then have dimension one as well, if, because they're different, and, uh, and it would be diagonalizable, sure. So I'm sort of lumping the real and the complex into this one fact. But as soon as I say the sum of all geometric mults, if you care only about the real and that's still true, then all of the eigenvalues must be real. Because if any of them were complex, this would be less than n. So this statement only includes complex eigenvalues. The algebraic multiplicities always add up to n for I including the complex ones. If there are no complex ones, then they do add up to n. If there are complex and you only use the reals and you sum up the algebraic multiplicities, you'll get less than n because you'll be ignoring the complex ones. So you have to be a little bit careful of that. But in practice, these things are usually very easy to distinguish from each other. OK, so in any case, if the sum of the multiplicities of the geometric one, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, if the sum of the geometric multiplicities is n, then we can also conclude not only does each geometric multiplicity equal the algebraic multiplicity, but also we can conclude that there is a, an eigenbasis of Rn, i.e., a collection V1 up to Vn, which is a basis, and such that each one of these is an eigenvalue real or complex, depending on your point of view. With each vi an eigenvalue, an eigenvector. Okay. 
i.e. a vi equals lambda i vi. So this is not true unless the sum of the geometric multiplicities is n. In matrices, what this means is that A can be written as S, D, S inverse, where S is the change of basis matrix consisting of the eigenbasis or an eigenbasis. There's not just one unique one. And D is diagonal with elements being the eigenvalues. And they have to be in the same order as these eigenvectors. You can write these eigenvectors in any order, but then that determines the order of the eigenvalues. But it's, it's, it's right no matter which order you write them in, as long as they're consistent. So same order. And everything in the middle, same order. Or corresponding. And believe it or not, that is nothing more than a way of writing this. S inverse changes everything into this basis. And diagonal matrices behave exactly like this. And then S is needed at the end to change it back to the first basis. A question? Yes, so this is the prescription of how to find S. All you have to do then to diagonalize a matrix, do I even want to write this separately or just sort of, maybe I, maybe I just want to tell you what's going on. Well, actually, I'll write it out very explicitly. So to diagonalize, first find the eigenvalues, and I already told you how to do that. I'll remind you. Second, find the eigenspaces. Per a minus lambda i n, and you need a basis for each each eigenvalue lambda. You need to find a basis of that. Write down all these basis vectors. that you found along the way with corresponding eigenvalues. So what I'll do is I'll write down V1, and underneath I'll put lambda 1 as the eigenvalue. And bear in mind that some of the vectors might have the same eigenvalues. So for example, if this is two-dimensional, you need to find two vectors which form a basis, and I put the same number under each of them. If there are n of them, if you have come up with n by exhausting all the eigenvalues, and possibly yourself in the process, if you have n, what you do is write down s equals this. You just throw these eigen basis vectors into a matrix as the columns, and you write D as the corresponding diagonal matrix. Again, I got that from preserving the order there. And again, it doesn't matter which order you do it in, as long as you match up the right pairs. And then A equals S, D, S inverse. Automatically. You've done all this stuff, and it, it will work if you didn't make a mistake. But if not, if fewer than M, N, then A isn't diagonalizable. 
meaning you cannot write A in that form. If you don't have N basis vectors, then A is not diagonalizable. And let me show you a very important example of a matrix that is not diagonalizable. A canonical example. Standard example of a non-diagonalizable matrix. Of non-diagonalizable matrix. One, one, zero, one. That's a perfect example. Or in more generality, or even one, one, k, zero for any k not equal to zero. So k equals one gives you this concrete matrix. Otherwise, you have one degree of freedom there. Let's see why. If you just take, let, let's just deal with this one just for argument's sake. 1 minus lambda, well, let, let me write it like this. Determinant, let's call this A. A minus lambda I is the determinant of 1 minus lambda, 1, 0, 1 minus lambda, which is 1 minus lambda all squared, which equals 0 when lambda equals 1 or 1. It's a multiplicity 2. So algebraic multiplicity 2. For lambda equals 1. Great, there's only one eigenvalue, so we can find the eigenspaces. Kernel of A minus lambda minus lambda I with lambda equals 1, that's the eigenvalue, is the kernel, we subtract 1 from the diagonal elements of this, and you get the kernel of 0, 1, 0, 0, which is just the span of the first base of the second, second one, one, zero, zero. See, this, if you apply this to x, y, you find that y has to be 0. The second coordinate of a vector cannot be anything other than 0 for it to be in the kernel. You can immediately write down that span. So the dimension is 1. So in particular, the geometric multiplicity equals 1. So we only have one eigenvalue with algebraic multiplicity 2, but the geometric multiplicity is 1. So there's no diagonalization. There's a very good reason why this couldn't be diagonalized anyway. If Alternatively, if 1, 1, 0, 1 equals S, D, S inverse, what the hell is the D? D is supposed to be a diagonal matrix whose entries are the eigenvalues. So D would have to be 1, 1. Because the eigenvalues are 1, 1. But that's just the identity. So this is just S, S inverse, which is itself the identity. But that's not true. This is bad. So this cannot be written in diagonal form. Another question. OK, so the question is, what, what restrictions are there on V? Sure, the V have to be eigenvectors, but they don't have to be orthonormal. Um, so you don't need to choose an orthonormal basis. You don't need to worry about their length. You, just ch you do need to worry that they are linearly independent. So if you have a two-dimensional eigenspace, you need to pick two vectors which aren't multiples of each other, or else it doesn't work. But other than that, you have this will work where for any choice of eigenbasis that you make up here, th this, this, as long as you pick a, a proper basis for each eigenspace, uh, then yeah, it doesn't matter. It's amazing, but it works. It just, it just doesn't matter. matter. It's not a unique way of diagonalizing by any means. You have freedom. The diagonal matrix, the only freedom you have is the order of these things. It, it, I mean, that's given, but 
the S matrix, there's, there's infinitely many choices. Another question. I'm sorry, is the... Why is the kernel of this matrix just the span of one zero? Well, I mean, if you multiply the matrix by x, y, you get y zero. And so if x, y is in the kernel, then the vector you get when you multiply should be zero, zero. So y equals zero. X can be anything you like. So that's the span of one zero. Question? Also, a Question. local octal similar to D is similar yes, to so D. Another characterization then is that diagonal matrix diagonalizable matrices are similar to diagonal matrices. Yes. So this is sort of the definition of diagonalizable. It's worth commenting that diagonalizable matrices are, by definition, similar to diagonal matrices. And this is just saying that if A equals S, D, S inverse, where D is diagonal, then A is similar to D. It's just, you know, it's just words, but worth saying by all means. You don't see any special question coming from that way. I bet you they could ask, is every diagonal, true or false, is every diagonal matrix, diagonalizable matrix, similar to a diagonal matrix? Yes. But no special properties that they can ask about it. I don't think there's anything special that they could ask about that I haven't already covered in that sense, because these are just different ways of saying the same thing. Okay, but here is a fact, and then I'll come to your question. Important fact. If an n by n matrix And have n distinct eigenvalues, and real or complex for that matter, but if they're n distinct ones, then automatically each geometric multiplicity is equal to 1. And there are n of them. So automatically, then each geometric multiplicity because each algebraic multiplicity is 1, equals 1. So A is diagonalizable. Matrix A. OK, so the case that we looked at here, it's a problem only because we had one eigenvalue of algebraic multiplicity 2. We didn't have two different eigenvalues. That doesn't mean it's a problem, but as it turns out, it was. On the other hand, if I had found that the two eigenvalues were 3 and 5, no problem. It's automatically diagonalizable. Okay, so a very important case then is when the eigenvalues are distinct. The only problem is when you have repeated eigenvalues, then the geometric multiplicity could be, for that eigenvalue, could be less. And then you'd have a problem. Do you still have a question? The question is, how do you prove that diagonalizable matrices are similar to diagonal matrix, matrices? Well, I mean, there's nothing to prove. You see, if A is diagonalizable, then it can be written as S, D, S inverse. And that says that A is similar to D. So and vice versa. But actually, speaking of the vice versa, it's sort of important to realize that everything works in reverse. If I tell you a matrix is diagonalizable, then automatically you know that every eigenspace has geometric, as in every eigenvalue, has geometric multiplicity equal to the algebraic one. So I, I, you should probably write down something about that, that sort of, you know, sometimes you know that a matrix is diagonalizable, or you're told that it is, and you should be aware that that means the reverse of everything that I said, namely that all the geometric multiplicities equal the algebraic multiplicities. So write down something, if you like, about that. Any other questions about the diagonalization? Obviously, again, I, I could do an example, but I, I think we'll be doing examples in the Q&A. So. We're still in the basics, as in basic properties, and we don't have much left to go. 
But I do feel like I should tell you about similar matrices since we just talked a little bit about them. And their relationship to eigenvalues, et cetera. So from pretty midterm stuff, we know that similar matrices essentially represent the same linear transformation, but with respect to a different basis. That's all. So the geometric object is the same. It sends the same vector to the same vector geometrically. But if you change a coordinate system, then the numbers change. The transformation remains the same. So that's one way of thinking about it. But more concretely, similar matrices have the same. characteristic polynomial. So two different matrices which are similar will have the same characteristic polynomial. They will have the same trace, the same determinant. They have the same rank and of course the same nullity. They have the same eigenvalues with both the geometric and algebraic. I'll say algebraic first. And geometric mults. So if you have two matrices which have different any ones of these six quantities, then they're not similar automatically you know they're not similar. Because if they were, they would be the same. To see that they have the same characteristic polynomial, you just actually have to multiply out det a minus lambda i, where a is s b s inverse. And you can be a little clever. And there's a computation. I'm not going to do it unless you really want to see it. But you can see directly computing that they have the same characteristic polynomial. And as soon as you know that, you automatically know they have the same trace, the same determinant. Because remember, trace and determinant are coefficients in the characteristic polynomial. And it's automatically true they have the same eigenvalues, because those are the roots of this polynomial. And it's automatically true that the algebraic multiplicities are the same. What's not as obvious from just that is the geometric multiplica uh, multiplicities. But if you think about what I said, it's the same linear transformation, but just with a different coordinate system. Then you'll see that the kernels have to be the same. They have to have the same dimension. All those, all those kernels of, of a minus lambda i. And that also explains why they have the same nullity and then the same rank. So all of this stuff comes out of two simple considerations. One, a computation, and the other, the geometry. But in any case, from a practical point of view, if you ask, if you look at two matrices and you notice any one of those six sort of quantities there are different for both of them, then you know they're not similar. Question. No. So the very important point is that the converse is not true. So it is not true that two matrices, even if they have the same all of this, even if all of these are the same, or any one of them is not necessarily true that they're similar. It's sort of sad, but that's the case. And I mean, for example, this is not similar to this. Even though they have the same characteristic polynomial, they have the same trace, the same determinant, the same rank, the same nullity, and the same eigenvalues algebraic. They don't have the same geometric multiplicities, though. So the particular, all the geometric multiplicities are equal to the algebraic multiplicities, and all the, and the eigenvalues are the same, they will be similar. OK, so this is the one slight converse that I'll give you. If two matrices have both got 
the algebraic and geometric multiplicities equal to each other in all the cases, and all the eigenvalues are equal, then both the matrices are diagonalizable by what I said before. And because the eigenvalues are the same, they are both diagonalizable with the same diagonal matrix. Therefore, they're both similar to the same diagonal matrix and therefore similar to each other. Okay, so in other words, in the very special case where two matrices, you know, so EG, so this is the only example of this. EG, A and B both have eigenvalues 3 and minus 1 of geometric multiplicity 2 and 1, respectively. And these are 3 by 3 matrices. Are, is A similar to B? Yes, both are similar to 3, 3, minus 1, that diagonal matrix. This is by the diagonalization. But that's only because the two geometric multiplicities add up to 3. OK, and so of course, remember if A is similar to C and C is similar to B, then A is similar to B. Similarity is transitive is the technical term for that. But otherwise, just because two matrices have the same characteristic polynomial doesn't mean they're similar. And this is the, this is the standard example. They have the same characteristic poly, 1 minus lambda all squared, and therefore the same trace determinant. As it turns out, they have the same rank and nullity. So they're not, but they're not similar. What's similar to the identity matrix, by the way? Tell me, uh, tell me any matrix which is similar to the identity matrix. K times the identity is similar to the identity matrix. Who thinks that's true, where K is not 1, I presume? So it's not true. K times the identity matrix is not similar to the identity matrix because they don't have the same characteristic polynomial, trace, determinant. They do have the same rank and nullity. What do you think? Any other with no, here's a counterexample to that. There's a tri upper triangular with diagonals 1. It's not similar. Actually, the only thing similar to the identity matrix is the identity matrix. I'm not going to write that down, but you could write that down. Here's the proof. If A is similar to the identity, then A is SI, S inverse. But SI is just S and S inverse is just I. So if A is similar to the identity, A is itself the identity. What you were thinking of when you said any multiple of the identity is this also works for any multiple of the identity. So K times the identity is only similar to K times the identity. So the identity is pretty special, pretty special. It's in its own class of similarity. OK, so in particular, no diagonal matrix <laughs> with the same diagonals as, the, as in one done the diagonal, no triangular matrix, rather, is similar to the identity. Also, every vector from the base would have to stay in the exact same thing, which means eigenvalues have to be 1. All right, so yes, along those sorts of lines then, similar matrices do not have the same need not have the same kernel image eigenspaces. So two similar matrices don't actually need to have the same kernel image or eigenspaces themselves. Eigenvectors must be the same. The dimension of the kernel and the dimension of the image must be the same. But the actual kernel and the actual image or the, and the eigenspaces need not be the same. 
And you say, wait a second, I thought you said that they represent the same linear transformation. Of course they do. Well, but the coordinate system has changed and therefore we've rotated everything around as it were. And so if you try to rotate the coordinate system back, you will find that the kernel and the image also rotate and so do the eigenspaces. So as it, it may not be a rotation, it also could involve some stretching and all that sort of stuff. So you don't get the same kernel image or eigenspaces. Okay, so do not expect similar major, I mean, you, you may have the same kernel possible for similar matrices. After all, any matrix is similar to itself. And two matrices which are the same matrix, yes, they have the same kernel, because it's the same bloody matrix. But in general, two similar matrices do not have the same. And that's pretty much all I want to say about similar matrices and eigenvalues. Any other questions? Okay, I promised a little bit of a look at the complex case beyond what I already did. But I'm just going to state the result because it's kind of turgid to compute it. We, we actually did most of the work to compute it already. But it turns out, so let's just look at the two by two complex case. So I'm assuming that we have a two by two matrix its characteristic polynomial is a quadratic. And quadratics either have two solutions, one real solution which is a double root, or no real solutions, in which case, since everything is real, the coefficients are all real, the complex solutions must be in conjugate pairs. Now, if you have two real solutions, then it's diagonalizable if they're different. They are, assume two different real solutions. If you only have one real solution, then you probably get into the same trouble that we've seen with a 1, 1, 1 matrix. So you're in a very twilighty sort of zone. But we haven't considered the case. Consider when the determinant of a minus lambda i in this simple two-dimensional case equals zero has two complex solutions. Lambda equals P plus IQ, and lambda equals P minus IQ. So it's a fact that every polynomial with real coefficients, any complex root that isn't real, its conjugate will also be a solution. That's just a fact. So when you only have a quadratic, the solutions are either, if, if the solutions aren't real, then they have to be P plus or minus IQ. And you can find it using the quadratic formula. Okay, the, suppose you find if V plus IW is a complex eigenvector or P plus IQ, then it's not too hard to compute that V minus IW is an eigenvector for P minus IQ. So V minus IW, rather, is an eigenvector for P minus IQ. In other words, you only need to find this. Only find the first one. You get the other one for free. So you look at P plus IQ. You can, pref if you prefer, look at P minus IQ. And then write down what the other one is. But let's just say... We always just try to find an eigenvector for P plus IQ, and then the other one is for free. Okay, so if that's true, the best you can do, you cannot diagonalize A in the real recent sense. You could write this. You could write this. A is S, D, S inverse. Could do this. But let's see what it has to be. S has to be a matrix consisting of the eigenvectors, which would be 
v plus i w in the first column and v minus i w in the second column. So this is a complex matrix here, complex two by two. And the D is a diagonal matrix, which is P plus IQ, P minus IQ. That's just the standard diagonalization written in this language where I'm writing the vectors as V plus IW instead of just V complex. S inverse is it? You can find it using the normal Jordan um, uh, Gauss Jordan elimination. It exists, or you can even find it using the standard method. This will be a two by two matrix with complex numbers as the entries. So you can switch these two, stick minuses out there, and divide by the determinant, which is AD minus BC. All the arithmetic still works, so the inverse makes sense. But I want you to understand that this is a decomposition of a real matrix into the product of three complex matrices. And if you multiply it out, I promise you everything, all the imaginary ones go away. But it's still something that is maybe less pretty than the other form which I'm gonna write down. Okay, so you can do that. Everything I said about diagonalization is fine. Notice, by the way, that there are two distinct eigenvalues, so it is diagonalizable. On the other hand, there is a real decomposition. You can write that A is S, B, S inverse, where S is simply equal to W, V. Watch out. It's counterintuitive. The V and the W are back to front. W is the imaginary part, and V is the real part. And B, I'm not going to dignify it by calling it D because it's not diagonal. Maybe I should call it R. Let me, let me call it R. S, R, S inverse. Maybe that's what the book calls it. R is, let me get this right, A minus B, B, A. So it's not diagonal. But you may recall that it is a rotation matrix if A squared plus B squared equals one. If A squared plus B squared is not actually one, it's a scale and rotation. So it's a, it's a scale, scaling rotation matrix. So this means that any two by two matrix with two complex eigenvalues is similar not to a diagonal matrix, but to a rotation scaling matrix. So what is a rotation scaling matrix? Just to understand, a scaling matrix just expands everything by rotates. So this, this matrix does that. It, it takes a vector, it, it expands it or shrinks it by a certain amount in, in any, any vector by the same amount and then rotates. That's exactly what that matrix does. And so, yeah, it's not diagonalizable, but it's essentially a rotation and a, and a scale. That's exactly what it is. Question? Yeah, right down there, that matrix. What are the rows? The rows, the the rows don't really represent anything in a sense. I mean, this is a complex number, a complex number, a complex number, and a complex number. What can I say? I mean. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll do an example of how to, how to uh, well, let, let me do an example anyway. What the hell? What the hell? Let's just try it for this. I'm sorry, what is the question? You mean here? No, no, you cannot write, v, v is two by two. Right, so V plus I W is a two, is a, I'm sorry, V is not two by two, V is a two vector, A, B, right? And W is a two vector. So when you pack these together, you get A plus I C, B plus I D. So there's two numbers that are complex that fill this in. Look, let me do an example and it will all become clear, I hope. Okay, here's an example of everything that I've just said. And I'm going to borrow this from the dynamical systems example I'm going to do next time. But I mean, this is probably worth seeing. So suppose A is equal to minus 1, minus 2, 
2 minus 1. Okay, find the eigenvalues, eigenspaces. Can you diagonalize? If not, can you express it as S R S inverse, where R is rotation scaling? Describe the matrix, describe everything, yada, yada. Say everything you possibly can, basically. Okay, so the determinant of A minus lambda I is the determinant of minus 1 minus lambda minus 2, 2 minus 1 minus lambda, which is minus 1 minus lambda all squared plus 4. which is lambda squared plus 2 lambda plus 5. That looks a little bit ugly. Am I sure that's what I wanted? Looks like it. Oh, yeah, no, this is fine. Actually, I was better off leaving it like this. If I write especially lambda plus 1 all squared plus 4, in any, whether you want to use the quadratic formula or directly from this, I can see that this is equal to 0 when lambda plus 1 all squared equals minus 4, i.e. lambda is equal to minus 1 plus or minus 2i. If you don't believe me, you can quickly, by the time I erase the next blackboard, use the quadratic formula on that and see also from that that lambda is minus 1 plus or minus 2i. OK, I've erased this, but I want to remember what this is. So let's take lambda equals minus 1 plus 2i. So the kernel of a minus lambda i is the kernel of, let's take the original here and subtract minus 1 minus 2i from both sides, so uh, from the diagonal. So minus 1 minus minus 1 plus 2i gives us on this diagonal here just 2i. And also on this diagonal you get 2i. And the other two are the same. So we need the kernel of this. Well, this is going to be the same as, let's just divide by 2 for sanity. I get i minus 1, 1i. So I, I need the vectors that make that Zero. Did I make a mistake? Uh, why is it? A, oh, yeah, it's minus 2i. Thank you. Yes, sorry. There's a minus 2 there. Good. Sorry about that. Yes, I was doing the minus 2i one by mistake. OK, so now that that's fixed, I still need to find this kernel. Now, I'm going to look at the bottom row. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that this is the span of i1. Do you believe it? Well, let's just check it out. Minus i, minus 1, 1, minus i, times this vector i1. What do you get? i times minus i is 1. Minus 1 is 0. And here, you get i minus i. Yay, that's it. Well, look, either I made a mistake here, which I actually did, but we fixed it in time. Or this, if this has actually got a proper kernel, then one row is a multiple of the other. So you only need to look at one of the rows. And I can see that i1 is clearly going to solve 1 minus i, right? i times that. I just switch those two and... Uh, change the sign. So also, by the way, you could have just done this. Or span of 1 minus i. That's the same as this. That's exactly the same as this. In fact, we can make it more interesting by doing this one, if we really want to. Not much more interesting, but why is this the same as this? Why is this the span the same as this span? Yeah, how do you get from this vector to this vector? i times this vector is this vector, right? i times 1 is i, i times minus i is 1. OK, so let's suppose you've chosen this span. What the hell? So basically then, 
if we choose this one, we have the following. 1 minus i, I want you to think of as 1, 0 plus i times 0 minus 1. So you have pulled apart the real and the imaginary parts like this. Okay? Now, I'm going to call this V and I'm going to call this W. This is an eigenvector for minus 1 plus 2i. So, 1 plus o minus i, like that, is automatically an eigenvector for the other eigenvalue minus 1 minus 2i. So immediately we can write down a complex diagonalization because we have a pair of eigenvectors and a pair of eigenvalues. So we could write the following. Sorry? This doesn't go and it doesn't. Where is the 2 come from? Where is the 2? Where is the 2? E vector for 1 plus 2i. Minus 1 plus 2i is the eigenvalue we were looking at. The other eigenvalue uh, for is minus, yeah, for, for lambda equals. OK? And this equals, by the way, 1i if you multiply it out. So here is a diagonalization where s is equal to the first eigenvector would be 1 minus i, and the second eigenvector would be 1 plus i. And, OK, question? OK. Here's the first eigenvector. It's v plus i w. And I told you that to get the other one, you do v minus i w. As in, you take the conjugate of, of everything of all those vectors, of all those uh, complex numbers. And if you, work, if you just change this plus to a minus and expand it out, you get 1 i. No? Yes? OK, yes. D is minus 1 plus 2i, minus 1 minus 2i. So this is the complex diagonalization. That's one possible expansion. But also, you can write A is S R S inverse, where S is equal to W V. Now, I want to come back over here for a second. V was 1, 0, which is the real part of one of these complex eigenvalues that we found, eigenvectors that we found. And W is 0, minus 1. So actually, S is 0, minus 1, 1, 0. And R according to the prescription that I had before, is A minus B, B A, where A is minus 1 and B is 2. So in that formula, A was the real part and B was the imaginary part. So this is minus 1, minus 2, 2, 1. And that's a rotation scaling matrix, believe it or not. Oh no, sorry, minus one here. A is minus one. Question. Yeah, the only way to do a kernel without just looking at it is to do Gauss-Jordan elimination, which would mean you divide this by minus i first, which would turn this into 1 minus i. Because believe it or not, 1 over i is minus i itself. So minus 1 over minus i is also minus i. 
So if you divide the top by minus i, you get 1 minus i. Then you could subtract that off, and you still end up exactly writing down one of these two, depending on your flavor. So. But 2 by 2 is easy. I'll go you and then you. Go ahead. OK, that's a good question. Did we explicitly check that the algebraic and geometric multiplicity is the same? Actually, there's two eigenvalues. They're different because one is p plus iq and the other one's p minus iq, so it's automatically, and it's only two by two. So they're automatically different. It's automatically diagonalizable, and the other representation also works. And then your question. Uh, the algebraic multiplicity is the same as Ha-ha, that's the question. Is, is it a coincidence that that's the same as a? It happens to be the same as a. And the answer is no, because A was already a rotation scaling matrix. And so, of course, this is similar to itself uh, in this particular example. Now, by the way, an easier way to see it is if you start with this basis, then the W vector is 1, 0, and the V vector is 0, 1, and the S that you will get is instead the identity. And then it then it's also comes out nicely like that. But more on that in a second. What's... Uh, for the A's and B's, do you guys know that the uh, eigenvectors are similar to A's? For the A's and the B's, they come out of the eigenvalue with the plus for this to work. ...that you get. Okay, so... Yeah, you need to take it from the plus for this to work. If you take it from the minus, it will also work, but then instead of switching the W and the V, I think you need V and the W in that order. I, I'm, there might be an extra minus sign as well. So better to follow this prescription. Now, I have to tell you, I've never actually seen an explicit example of this um, in a past final. Instead, I've seen the application to dynamical systems, which comes out of it. And we will look at that uh, next time when we do that. Now, what else do I have to say about this? OK, so then just back to your question as to whether it is a coincidence that this is the same as A. It isn't because A happened to already be rotation scaling. If you looked at the form of A, it is in the form. It's in this form. So it's a pretty bad example from that point of view. But it happens to work. OK? Another question. Is the reason for this No, actually, that's a good, that's a good question. The nice thing, as we know, about this form, the diagonal form, is that powers of A become very straightforward. A to the T is S, D to the T, S inverse. But it's not easy to take powers of these rotation scaling matrices. It's not impossible, but it's a bit more tricky. Why do you need to do it? Well, for differential equations, it does show you, as in for the dynamical systems, especially the, the discrete dynamical systems, it does show you what the trajectory should be. It's, you know, the, you get these trajectories, and I'm going ahead, of, that look like uh, spirals, elliptical spirals. And the reason is because you get the rotation and the scaling. And if you, if you keep applying a rotation scaling matrix, if the scale is 1, you'll just get a circle if you keep on rotating. Because the eigenvalues are different, you get an ellipse. If the scale is greater than 1, though, as you rotate, you are also expanding. So OK. And you're actually expanding exponentially. So I should really be all the way, OK. And then around there, and et cetera. But I'm not going to do that, because I still have minutes. OK. Anyway. So most of the time, you do not get the same matrix back. So maybe in that sense, it was a bad example. On the other hand, because the computation was so straightforward, we got the same, ex same thing back. And you know, we'll, we'll revisit this in Q&A, no doubt, as well, especially in the case of the differential equations. OK, still, that's what I wanted to say about the basics, which brings me, and I'll have enough time to at least do the spectral theorem. So part B is symmetric matrices and the spectral theorem. Uh, 
and quadratic forms. Okay. So one spectral theorem. Okay, so here's what it says. First of all, if A is symmetric, i.e. A transpose equals A, then all eigenvalues of A are real. There's no complex eigenvalues that are not real. No specifically complex eigenvalues. Also, eigenspaces, I'll write the word out, for different eigenvalues are orthogonal. If you have two different eigenvalues and you pick any two eigenvectors for those corresponding eigenvalues, I guarantee you, if the matrix is symmetric, that the two eigenvectors that you get are orthogonal to each other. That's just not true for most matrices. What good is it? What good is it? Well... Orthogonality is a really nice thing because you know how easy it is to write projections. It means that everything is just a rotation. So even if they weren't orthogonal, we could take some other spaces. Which Only if it's diagonalizable. Uh, orthogon yeah, but you've changed the geometry. You've changed the determinants. Orthogonal transformations have determinants. One, the volumes change. Here, nothing changes. So anyway, here is the theorem. In a nutshell, A is diagonalizable and A equals S D S inverse where S can be chosen orthogonal. i.e. S inverse equals S transpose. In other words, symmetric matrices have a orthonormal eigenbasis, i.e. if A is symmetric, it has an orthonormal eigenbasis. That's another way of saying the spectral theorem. And the converse is true, although it's not as interesting as converse is true. And by the converse, what I mean is, if A has an orthogonal, orthonormal eigenbasis, then A must be symmetric. Or if you prefer, if A equals S, D, S inverse, where D is real and S is an orthogonal matrix, then A is automatically symmetric. But that's not the very exciting part. What's an eigenbasis? It's a collection of eigenvectors that form a basis. Okay? I defined it earlier, but it's okay. Uh, well, if S is an orthogonal matrix, then the columns of S are orthonormal. They're an orthonormal basis. So this just says A is similar to D, and the transformation matrix, the change of basis, is an orthonormal basis, meaning it's just a rotation. So you can rotate A, as it were. You can change the coordinate system without distortion. See, this is to your thing. This, if, if it's not orthogonal, an orthogonal transformation, then you're doing some sort of distortion. You're squishing some parts and stretching some others. 
Okay, and that means you're changing volumes and you're changing everything. But here, for symmetric matrices, all you have to do is do some rotation, and you will get a diagonal matrix. Okay? Does that answer your question? Right. So all that's left is to say how to do this. And then I'll stop. To do this... Given a symmetric matrix, all you do is exactly the same thing. Follow the previous algorithm, for diagonalization that I gave before. Except that instead of finding a basis for each eigenspace, you need an orthonormal basis. For each eigenspace. So in particular, and I just need this one bit of space in order to elaborate on that. In particular, you're computing the kernel of A minus lambda i n for a bunch of different lambdas. So you have to do multiple computations. And if you find that this, if this equals span of just one vector, and this could be different for each lambda, but if you find that this equals span of one vector, you should take u1 to equal v1 divided by its length. You have to normalize it. But if instead you find it's a two-dimensional eigenspace, so the geometric multiplicity is two, mm -hmm. then you have to do Gram-Schmidt. And the same true, or even more than two. Use the Gram-Schmidt. So you have to know Gram-Schmidt to get u1, u2, and so on. And actually, I might mention that u1 in the Gram-Schmidt is exactly v1 over v1 length. So technically, this is already Gram-Schmidt on the one-dimensional space. But hey, I mean, all you're doing is normalizing. so. It, it's, it's a little bit grandiose to call it Gram-Schmidt. Anyway, so you do this for every eigenvalue, and any of the one-dimensional eigenspaces you do this, and any of the two plus eigenspaces you have to use Gram-Schmidt to get an orthonormal basis. There are lots of examples of that. Once you have done, you have gotten S is equal to U1, U2, up to Un and d equals lambda 1 as before, up to lambda n. Just a second, just a second. The point here is that instead of taking an arbitrary eigenbasis, by using Gram-Schmidt on each eigenspace, you end up with an orthonormal eigenbasis there, which means that you still have a equals s d s inverse, but remember, orthogonal matrices are precisely those with orthonormal bases. So this will guarantee the orthogonal decomposition. I had a question up the back. Um, where is it? Withdrawing the question? Any other questions? Go ahead. Yes, so uh, this is also equal to S, D, S transpose because S inverse is S transpose. That's not explicitly the advantage of it, but I mean, it is nice to have that representation as well. And we will be using that when we do quadratic forms, for example. So quadratic forms give rise to symmetric matrices. So the only things left are quadratic forms and dynamical systems. 
Next week, I think, is it Tuesday? Tuesday, 7.30 next week, we're back in the Glio room. Okay, and I will finish those two topics and Q&A for whatever is left.